T13, if you remember, was a very hard, was a very difficult year. And uh, everyone was sort of hoping and praying that 2014 would be easier. And towards the end of 2013, God began to give us a word for 2014. But as you know, God speaks, the Bible says, darkly through a glass. So he never really gives you the full picture, but he expects you to work out what he's saying. And so from December of 2013, one began to prepare for 2014. And the message God gave us was Deuteronomy 3, verse 23. I remember preaching about Moses. Moses said, Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O oh Lord God, you have begun to show your servants your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, O oh God, let me cross over and see the good land that behind beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. And before the end of the year, in our private prayer group, this was our prayer point. We pray, O oh God, that we would cross over. And that was the message I intended to preach for thirty first night, because they have the words crossover. I thought how appropriate. O oh God, we would pray at our meeting. Let us cross over and see the good land. Take us into a good land. Take us into a glorious land. Let us see those pleasant mountains and the Lebanon. I remember sharing in church at the time that it was very important not just to pray for the crossover. It was important to see what 2014 had in store for us. And it was important to enter into the fullness of 2014. And in the next verse, the Bible says, The Lord, Moses said, The Lord was angry with me on your account. The Lord would not listen to me. And it came to a point where God said to Moses, Enough of that. Do not speak to me about this matter any longer. You go up to the top of Mount Pisgah. Lift your eyes towards the west and the north and the south and the east. Behold, behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over. And from these scriptures, I began to put together a message. Even though the first night, I preached resurrection. I preached the power of resurrection. I mentioned that Mr. Rappo and I were going through a challenge at the time, and God brought us through. So I felt for the first night, preach the power of resurrection from the story of Lazarus. But in my spirit, the message God had given us was a message of Moses. And from these scriptures, I was able to put together a message. And I said, let's pray that we would come into 2014. I remember talking about, you know, services where people would celebrate the crossover night. They would cross over into the year, but never really enter into the benefits of the year. So a lot of our prayers was, Oh God, show us what you have in store for us for 2014. Oh God, keep us as we enter into 2014. And oh God, 
may we enter into the fullness of everything that the land of promise has for us. Remember that the promised land is not heaven. For us as Christians, we come out of the Egypt of this world We come out of the yoke of Pharaoh that represents the devil. And we enter into a wilderness experience. But daily as Christians, we're called to press into the promises of God. So your promised land is the place where, on a daily basis, you're entering into God's perfect plan for you. The Bible says, the thoughts I have for you, says the Lord, are thoughts of good, not of evil, to give you a future, to give you a hope, and to give you an expected end. So we began to pray, oh God, that we may embrace the land of God. January in particular, there's something you have in store. I remember saying, but sometimes people go on a holiday around December and find it difficult to resume in January. So I said, don't have a holiday mentality. Link your 2013 to your 2014. And if you were to take a break at all, take a break in February. Let February be your hinge month, the month that propelled you into the rest of the year, or your transition month, or your Camp Gilgal, the place where you launch from, where you launch in to the rest of the year. May we enter into the place of better marriages, better relationships. May we come into the place of wealth. We're urging people to see what God can do. But I, I, I love those scriptures. Because God told Moses, mm, Moses, you're not able to enter in. I'm really angry with you. Why was God angry with Moses? You know the scriptures. Moses was exasperated at some point. And God had told him, okay, Moses, I want you to the rock of the time the Israelites were complaining they were thirsty. Previously, he had struck the rock and water came out. You know the story, don't you? But this time, God had said to Moses, just speak, speak to the rock. But Moses, out of exasperation, struck the rock. And God said, Moses, I'm really mad at you. I'm angry with you. Because of what you do, you won't enter in. Moses said, the people That's why I struck the rock a second time. And I think on a Wednesday evening, I broke down the scriptures. I was talking about the things that could stop you from coming into the land of promise. The things that could stop you from embracing those things that God has for you in 2014. And one is the issue of your character. Moses needed anger management. Moses needed to deal with internal issues in his life. I'm not saying to deal with things within. Deal with the little foxes within. I will spoil the vine. Sort out issues of character. Sort out not just anger. Issues of morality. Issues of honesty. Issues of integrity. Issues of righteousness. Issues of holiness. These are the things that will stop you. That Moses was hindered from coming. Then I spoke about the people. Moses said, You people got me into trouble. So not only did Moses have issues. And I was saying, if all you think about is what people will think about you, you'll never 
go forward. Not everyone is happy with your progress. Not everyone is celebrating your success. So why do you think that everyone will celebrate you? What makes you think it's people's opinion of you that will propel you to go forward? Some people are completely immobilized because of what people think about them. Okay, so you made a mistake that God has forgiven you. But what the people think is what stops you and hinders you. There are many people who are so battered by what people would say. Your every move depends on what people think. Your sense of self-esteem, your feeling of self-worth, is only when people say you're looking good, you're doing well. If no one says that, you don't function. And should they say you're not doing well, that's the end of your life. Paul said, if I were to be a pleaser of men, I would not be a servant of God. Many of you are pleasers of men. Many of you fear men more than you fear God. And God will always bring you to the place where He challenges your trust in men. Where people will disappoint you. Where people will let you down to see where your faith really lies. So Moses faltered not just because of his internal issues, not just because of character issues, but because of his response to the people. And then thirdly, Moses could not come into the place of new methods. God said, speak. He was so used to what God had done before, strike. I said, many of you will fail to come into 2014 because you'll be seeing things the way you saw it in the past. But God may be changing the rules. But if you go back to the scriptures, God said to Moses, now get onto the mountain and cast your gaze towards the east, the west, the north, the south. Behold, behold it with your eyes. You shall not cross over. So our prayer was, Lord, we want to cross over. We want to see. We want to cross over. And we want to embrace. Then God gave Moses instructions for Joshua. He said, but Moses, I would like you to command Joshua. Locate Joshua. Locate the Joshua people. So as we learn from the errors of Moses, we also receive insight from God's instruction to Joshua. Command Joshua. Encourage Joshua. James Version says, Charge in Joshua, strengthen Joshua, for he is the one to go over before this people. So that there is a Moses people who will not cross over, but there is a Joshua people who would come into an inheritance. I was charging us to come into the place of our identity in Christ. That we are sons of God. And as sons of God, we have an inheritance. Whenever the Bible speaks about sonship, it's speaking about an inheritance from our Father. 
So the Joshua people who would inherit the land also have to operate in what I call sonship dimension. They know they have an inheritance. They know that there is a good land. They know the world is waiting for them. They know business is waiting. They're called to better relationships, stronger marriages. They're called to raise their children in the fear of the nurture of the Lord. They're called to do business. They're called to take the world. They're called to come into business, into education, into finance. They're called to make a difference. They're called to affect the environment where they go. They're called to establish the kingdom of God wherever they are. And that's been the message of this church. You can make it. You can do it. Take a step of faith. Go call a meeting. Go make that phone call. Go take the land. Go start a new business. Go to the embassy. Get your visa. Trust God. Believe God. Are there any believers, I would say? We are a Joshua people. Let's rise up. This is our time. That was December, January, February. Then I remember what happened. March 1 or 2. The very first week in March, we had a prayer meeting where just a few people showed up. I said, what's going on? He said, Pastor, you might not know. There's a fuel crisis. I said, so? So how are they going to get to this meeting? Oh. I remember saying to the guys I pray with, do you remember when we began to pray? And I've been praying for 25 or 30 years. When we began to pray, there was a season I had no car. And to make a prayer meeting, I remember walking from Maryland to Jelaga, then took a bus to where the meeting was holding. I said, Do you guys remember when you didn't have the wives, the kids, the cars? But somehow, we, we made it. I said, Remember those times when you had night vigils on your own? Remember those times when you didn't have all the fine things of life? Yet we believed God. How come it's in the midst of comfort that we are complaining? That was early March. Shortly after, Boko Haram came on the scene with the kidnap of the girls. Can I be honest with you? Since then, we've been in a crisis. Till now. But is it not the crisis that we face character? Shift the entire world that the only things that will remain are the things of the kingdom. The fire is burning. Is it not the fire that tells us which material is wood and burns up in the flame and which 
gold that gets finer and more refined by the heat. Oh God, the warfare! Is it not the warfare that separates between the men and the boys? No warfare, no victory, no exams, no success. And so from March to September, it's been one problem after the other. It's been one challenge after the other. Some are asking, where are you, oh God? And God was saying, what do you mean, where, I, where am I? I already told you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why is there so much trouble around us? Has God not told you, I'm a present help in time of trouble? What's your problem? Ebola! God is saying, have I not said I'm your healer? Do you know in the past six months, it's been tough. We thought 2013 was hard. 2014 was even worse. And you're complaining. What happens? When the horsemen show up. Jeremiah you're complaining when the waters are calm. What happens when there's a flood? Be strong, Jeremiah. Be bold, Jeremiah. Be encouraged, Jeremiah. Be strengthened, Jeremiah. The challenge for many of us is that we have imbibed an incorrect gospel. We have absorbed an incomplete message of the kingdom. Jesus never promised us security from away from the storms of life. What he promised us was a security inside the crisis. So there's a shaking in the world and people are falling. There's a crisis in the world and people are collapsing. Where are the men and women of character? Where are the men and women of integrity? Where are the men and women of sight, of vision, of capacity, of tenacity? Somehow all the people wanted was someone to blow on the microphone and then their breakthroughs would come. The angels are flying in, carrying your breakthrough. For you, Ooh, the money is flying into your hands. But that's not the complete gospel. The Bible talks about darkness, intense darkness, and we call to shine. The Bible talks about desolation, and we call to make a difference. The Bible called, talks about the earth groaning and we arising as the sons of God. The Bible speaks of you and I being 
light in the midst of the darkness. We are the ones who carry the light, the revelation, the illumination. All over the world. I went on a vacation that was not really a vacation. And right now, I need a holiday from my holiday. Because everywhere when there's trouble, people in my humanity. If it's not ISIS, beheading people on TV, it's stories of violation or kidnapping or abuse. Everything just seems to be falling apart. I was in the church and I was saying there's some areas we can't even talk about in America right now. You can preach about homosexuality publicly. And I'm just hearing new, new tales of trouble. Did you read the report about the, the lady who's in a relationship with her daughter? And she said they discovered they loved each other at 16, when she was 16. But she had to wait for the law. She had to wait until the girl was 18. She had to wait until the girl was 18 before they started a sexual relationship. And she was speaking so that other people in such a situation could also come out and be recognized. And they had a right to their own life. And when they interviewed the, the young girl, she said, well, she's learned how to separate mom from lover. Have you watched all those animal programs? Notice the intimacy that's growing now. Notice the kissing with animals that's ongoing now. I love animals. But there is a new level of intimacy. A woman said, my dog is more faithful than a man. Have you noticed atheism is growing? Have you noticed, I've been warning for years, that the people teaching our kids philosophy are gay and LGBT. You may have read the one about the two, two twins, two brothers that were twins. And they were gay. But their parents accepted but then encourage them to come up with their relationship. It's okay. That's what their challenge was on the block, the road. How do we tell our parents that we're each other's lovers? And the rest of on the block is be strong and come out with it. There's trouble everywhere. The challenge is everywhere. The difficulty is everywhere. But God did not leave us without guideposts. He did not leave us the rest of direction. He's already given us His word. But because we had not seen what God was saying, we lost out. And for the past six months, Church, most churches are on a decline. People are saying, This is not what I thought Christianity was all about. What did you think? If I, you came to the if I priest to make a sacrifice on your behalf to the idol, and then you're cleared of all your problems. No responsibility on your part for strength, for character, for integrity for capacity, for authority, for influence. What did you think? When Jesus introduced John the Baptist, he said, what did you go out to see? What were you looking for? You're looking for a man in fine raiment. He said, I was a prophet. Did the Bible not say endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ? 
Does the Bible not talk about being strengthened with might in your inner man? Does the Bible not talk about pressing forward? And so December, January, February, God was saying, be encouraged, be strengthened. Did we not also interject the message of Joshua and Moses with that of Goliath? Did we not say, have the word of God in your mouth? See what God can do. Did we not say, see the head of Goliath in your hand? That when David ran towards Goliath, he said, this day, I will cut off your head. Yes, he only had a thing. He saw something and he went after it. But in the past six months, it's like church has become from the garden, the crash, babies everywhere. And that's okay if they're three months in the Lord. But many of these Christians are. Two years, five years, ten years, fifteen years. John said, I speak to you, young men. I speak to you, fathers. I speak to you, babies. Many of us should have known God. He said, I speak to you, fathers, the older ones, because you have known him who was from the beginning. You know him. You're no longer moved by the things around you. You know him. You understand his ways. That our father is not a civilian, he's a man of war. That our father wants his children to be tough and rugged. When I preach in two churches, I say to them, Well, you guys don't have problems, so you don't understand why our message has changed. Of course, I know they have problems. They say, We have problems. I said, Of course. I said to them, guess what? That I have to sit with a security board and hear a security consultant explain how not to park cars to mitigate the impact of a bomb blast. I'm thinking, a pastor's job. I said, now we have to separate seats in church and give people social space because of the fear of the board. And now, you come to church in the morning. The fear is palpable. The tension. Church has lost all its workers. They're busy trying to survive. But even the government says to us, don't go to church, by the way. Avoid gatherings. So people will avoid them, markets, avoiding malls, and they were avoiding churches also. Some of the pastor and one of your online members. There's internet self-creation. Because Calvin is now trouble. Not to talk of our income. Thank God for this church. Thank God for those of you who've been faithful. I'll be honest. There's a general decline. And God is shaking. Isn't it clear that this is God shaking? Isn't it clear that this is God groaning? Isn't it clear that this is God sifting? But people just can't seem to see. Is there anyone not going through a shaking? Is there anyone not going through some challenges? My prayer for you this season, as you said, is that you will be defined not by the crisis, but by your response to the crisis. You know how to say the woman with the issue of blood, the man born blind, that woman always complaining, that man always borrowing money, that family always cheating. Never let people define you by your problems. Let them define you by the way you respond. Part of the identity
identity of the child of God is the way they respond in crisis. The enemy wants to make you a victim in the crisis. Yet God wants you to be a victor in the crisis. But where are those victorious people? Where are those strong Christians? Where are those men and women who can stand in the fire? Where are those who can speak when everything is falling apart? Where are those who can shine as light in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? Where are those who can calm the storms? Why are people falling apart at this time? Lack of character. Lack of strength. Lack of courage. Lack of boldness. It's as though they never had a foundation. As though their foundation was built on the sand. The church is shrinking. Yes, because the Lord knows those who are His. It's not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, who shall enter into the kingdom. Some will say, Lord, we gave, we came to church. I never knew you. You had no understanding of my ways, of my word, of the need for character and responsibility and strength and grace. How many of you have met this lady? Dr. Adar's story was the most read story worldwide in the past few days. Here's the lady who contracted Ebola but survived to tell the story. If you haven't read that story, I think you should just Google Dr. Adar Ebola. It would come up on so many blogs, so many sites. We told the story initially in Bella Niger. You know, sometimes you go through issues in life. You ask God, why me? Why me? There was a lady who didn't ask, why me? She stood in faith. She stood trusting, believing. There was a lady who said, I'm coming out of this alive. I am a survivor. There was a lady in the midst of her, what she called the house of death. She began to encourage other people. She began to speak life. And had holy communion services with others in the world. Told a very moving story. Many of us wept as we read that story. She ended by saying, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. I came out on stage. so much for the encouragement, the prayers, and the well wishes. Thank you, Pastor Tony. Um, my experience was, um, for me, was earth shaking. You know, it was threatening everything I knew. Young doctor, you know, planning to do a lot my life and three weeks after I started work at the hospital I meet Patrick Sawyer and I didn't have a lot of contact with him but you know 
when I confirmed him dead, oh, I can't quite describe the way I felt when I, I went in that morning and I saw he was dead. The reality suddenly hit a dawn that he could easily be dead as well in the next couple of weeks. Did you touch him? Did you have contact with his blood or any of his fluids? I kept thinking and wondering to myself, what have I done? What have we done? We did the best we could do. We were limited, but I was so anxious on that day and when I'm anxious, I usually go to the bathroom a lot. So <laughs> I had gone about six times just out of anxiety. So when, you know, the federal government and the Lagos state government was trying to do what they could do to calm everybody down and let us know that it's only when you have a fever that you can start to panic. But for now, no. And then even if you have a fever and it turns out to be Ebola, we'll take care of you, so don't worry. Um, it was confirmed that I had Ebola. And I could say I was kidnapped because I wasn't told on the phone. You know, I was lured into the isolation center and when I got there, I saw the environment. I wouldn't wish my enemy to be there at that time. Things got better, yes. But I said, I have to fight. I have to survive. There is no question of what if I, there is no what if. It will not happen. I will live. I said to God, I'm young. I need to live until I don't have teeth. Well, I don't know why I want to live until I don't have teeth, but that's what I told him. And I was actually laughing, but you know, I knew that I had to encourage others there as well. And I thank God for all the prayers because I knew that I was being prayed for. I knew that people were praying for me. Everyone was praying for me. Thank you so much to everyone who prayed for me. I felt it. I would tell you that the strength came from God. The healing came from God. I knew it wasn't ORS. Even though I had to drink the fluid, I knew it, it couldn't have been ORS. It wasn't the paracetamol. It wasn't anything. I didn't eat for days. But I had the strength. I was helping other patients to get things outside because they couldn't call on any other person. Doctor, doc, doctor, doc, come and get the doctor, da. You know, I was the one who was called upon because I seemed to be the one who was up and about. But I thank God and I thank you so much for the prayers. I am eternally grateful, forever grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for standing by me. I don't think you've contracted Ebola, but you've done nothing. What legacy have you left behind? What are you doing? Sometimes I stand outside of the service and ask people, what are you doing for the kingdom? What have you done for us? Oh, Pastor, you know, I try. Can you make a difference this season? What was it that God laid hold of you? Said, I pray that I might lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of me. Paul said, talking about God, He has saved us and called us. Many people live a saved life, not a called life. When you live called, there's passion, there's zeal, there's fervency, there's illumination. There's a sense of mission. There's a sense of purpose. There's something in your gaze. I, I got born again at 29. I got married at 30. This rap was 26. From then to today. We didn't think we were going to be in ministry. When I see people without the fire, I can't understand it. When I see people without passion, I'm perplexed. Don't they know who has saved them? Don't they know the purpose for the existence? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your resources? Where are you hiding in shame? Where are you hiding in fear? 
Why are you negligent about your duties in God? Why don't you show some faith? Why don't you show some fire? Listen, guys, I want to let you, I want to release you at this time. Go get a life in God. Go make a difference where you live. Go touch life somewhere. Go engage the world. The darkness is the perfect backdrop for the light of God to shine. The Bible says, attend to my word. Keep your eyes on my word. That means keep your eyes on the word or the environment will snare you away from the word. And I encourage you today that there is a life, there is a place, there is a position that's waiting for you. But there's something, the world is waiting, the angels are waiting. What are you doing? God looks from heaven. The angels can't even believe it. Oh God, I want you to turn to God today. Just say a simple prayer. The apostle will say, Oh God, behold your threatenings and grant us the boldness. Grant us the wisdom. Grant us the courage. What steps ought you to take today? What moves ought you to be making? What excuses are stopping you from entering in? When you cast them away, it's time to rise up. It's time to see as God sees. Listen, this week, go start again. Go make a difference. Go reconcile with your husband. Go reconcile with your wife. Go make that phone call. Go reconcile with the people around you. Go start out. Go restructure your life. Go restructure your business. Go back to the embassy. Between now and the end of the year, can you make a difference?